Now let's take a look at how to slice our audio into different parts so that we can process it in more interesting ways. This is really the essential part of a sample-based workflow, whether it be on a hardware device or in software, and therefore you want to be able to do it efficiently and quickly, and luckily Ableton Live allows you to do just that. If you just right-click on one of your audio clips and go down to Slice to New MIDI Track, you're presented with a very basic window with some options. You can slice the audio to various different note divisions, down to 30 second notes all the way up to one bar, as well as slicing it to your custom warp markers. So for instance, if I had set warp markers to only be at certain hits in the loop that I wanted to chop out, the Slice to New MIDI feature would understand that and would make slices only for where I had custom warp markers set. I'm going to keep this on half notes because I'd like each of my slices to be one half note long. Down here we have the slicing preset. Now Live comes with a few different presets already built in, and they can be a lot of fun to use. The most bread and butter one to use though is the built-in zero velocity preset. What that does is takes all of your slices and divides them up onto the drum pads in a drum rack, and each of the pads plays back at maximum velocity no matter how hard you hit your keyboard or whatever input device that you're using. However, if you'd like Ableton Live to respond to the velocity with which you're hitting your input device, then simply use the built-in preset and not the built-in zero velocity preset. I'm just going to use this preset for simplicity and hit OK. Live quickly processes all of your audio and creates a new MIDI clip, which represents the audio clip that you just chopped. So if I play back this MIDI clip, you hear exactly what you heard in the audio clip. Now as you can see this is a little odd because Slice 1 doesn't actually have any audio on it. It's not playing back anything and indeed the MIDI clip that was created starts playing back at Slice 2. Sometimes Ableton Live does this and it's just a side product of the slicing feature. It's really nothing to worry about. Simply delete Slice 1 for simplicity because it's not doing anything. And there you go. Here you have all of your pads with relevant audio on them. So now I have my MPD-24 turned on and ready to trigger some slices in this drum rack. And as you can see, it's just like an MPC where you can trigger the various audio clips with your pads. The first thing to take a look at here is the default macro knobs that come up. These are extremely useful presets and I rarely change them, but I'm going to show you how to create your own slicing presets so that you can custom tailor your own workflow with the most common knobs that you'd like assigned right here. But for now let's take a look at this preset because of how useful it is. The most important part of it is your ADSR envelope here. Each of these knobs is assigned to the relevant parameter in every one of the simpler devices that was loaded up with our slices. So for instance, the attack knob is assigned to the attack parameter in the volume envelope of every single one of these slices. That's the nice thing about these macro knobs, is that each one can be assigned to multiple parameters. If you want to see the parameters that each knob is controlling, simply turn on the map mode function right here. As you can see, macro knob 1 is assigned to the attack parameter of all of these nine slices. And the same goes for decay, sustain, and release. The knobs below control the looping of each of the slices. If you want to do some really crazy glitched out stuff, this is where you should go first. So for instance, if I set up some interesting settings down here and hold down the pads, you'll start to hear looped playback and it'll sound more and more like melodic instruments rather than drum hits. As you can see, that's a lot of fun to play with, and you can create some really magnificent glitched out effects just using those four simple knobs that pop up with this preset. Now, generally the way that I do things when it first loads up all my slices here is that I set release all the way full, so that every time I trigger one of these slices, it plays all the way through. Also, I want to reset all these loop settings because I don't need them right now. So now whenever I trigger a slice, it'll play all the way through.
and I don't have to keep the key or pad held down. I generally also set the attack all the way down to zero. The reason the attack is set up that way by default is that sometimes you'll have clicks and pops at loop boundaries, however that's rarely the case that I've found. The slice to MIDI preset is actually really good with finding parts of the loop that aren't going to cause too many pops and clicks. Now let's take a look at the pad views here in a little bit more detail so you understand what's going on. Now remember I sliced my loop to half notes, so each of these pads represents a half note of audio information. If I take a look at the first pad that has audio on it, that's the very beginning of the loop, you can see that it's by default loaded up a simpler device, and you remember we talked about that before. Now every simpler device that's loaded onto these pads is referencing the same audio file that we chopped up, except that its loop settings are set perfectly to represent the sliced portion that we set up in the slicing dialog. So that means each of these simplers is only playing back a half note. Also realize that some of the knobs in the simplers have green boxes above them. And when a parameter has a green box over it, that just means it's being overridden by one of the macro knobs over here. So for instance, if you wanted this macro knob to control all of these slices except for the first slice, I can just select the first slice, right click on the release knob, and go up to unmap from release. And now the release knob in the macro section will not control the release parameter on that first simpler. And that's a really handy thing to have around in case you change up one of these slices in a special way so that it's not really related to the other slices. I'll go ahead and remap that for now because that's the way I want it to be set up. So the next question you might be asking is, how are these different knobs functioning and doing all these crazy things? Now for instructional purposes, I think the most interesting knob here is the loop length knob. The reason for that being is that it's controlling not one but two parameters at the same time. As soon as you increase it beyond zero, it turns on the looping function. Not only that, but it increases the loop parameter. So if we come back up here to map mode and take a look at the loop length macro knob, right here, you can see what's going on. As you can see, for every slice, this knob is controlling two parameters, sample loop on, as well as sample loop length. Any value above zero, when assigned to an on-off button like this, will turn the button on. And then of course a value of zero will turn the button off. And then of course loop length is expressed in percentage. It's also interesting to note that the loop length can never go above 90%. Even when this macro knob is all the way up, you can see that loop length down here doesn't go above 90%, and that's because 90% has been set as the maximum value to which that knob can affect that parameter. And that brings me to my next point about why macro knobs are just so incredibly powerful. If I assigned a macro knob, for instance, to the decay time of a reverb, and in addition to that I assigned it to the loop length setting on a simpler, I could actually set it so that the knob decreases the decay time on the reverb while it increases the loop length setting on the simpler. And that's as simple as just reversing the minimum and maximum settings for each of the macro knobs. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. For now let's turn map mode off and I'll reset these looping settings. For a moment let's move back up to our MIDI clip that was automatically created when we sliced the audio on this audio track. As you can see, it sliced half note portions just like I wanted it to, and it arranged them in a stair-step fashion so that slice two plays for a half note, slice three plays for a half note, etc., etc., all the way up to slice nine. So when I start this playing back, it of course plays back the loop as it originally sounded. However, the beautiful part about this is that now that the loop is represented as MIDI notes rather than audio, it's very easy to rearrange the way the loop sounds. I can take each of these half note chunks and reorder them in any way I want to, including chopping them down to less than a half note each. For instance, say I wanted to play the first slice for a quarter note twice in a row rather than just one time as a half note. I can just reduce the size of the note and then I can just hold down Alt or Option, depending on if you're on a Mac or a PC, select it and then just drag it right over. Now it'll play twice in a row at a quarter note rather than one whole time as a half note. But of course that brings up another problem. You probably heard that this new quarter note trigger we put in here kept playing and overlapping this second slice when it was triggered. 
That sounds kind of sloppy right now, and it can lead to a really muddy mix. Well, let's go back to the drum rack. And if you remember, I told you before about choke groups. And this is the situation where choke groups are really going to come in handy. If you just click on this middle button right here, you get a few more buttons down here. Just turn on the I.O. button, and that's where you're going to find your choke groups. Let's go through and assign all of these slices to the same choke group. That way they can never overlap each other and muddy up the mix. So I'll just assign each one of these to, actually let's go with choke group 16 because that's closer to where my mouse is. It really doesn't matter, just as long as any of the slices that you don't want playing at the same time are assigned to the same choke group. It doesn't matter what number you choose. Now if I come back here to our modified MIDI clip and play it again, this note won't overlap this one. Rather, this note right here will abruptly cut off this trigger right here, which is exactly what we want. That sounds much cleaner and a lot cooler. So now we can go back through and further rearrange the loop. Say I wanted to change the trigger times between these two slices right here. And also I want to shorten this one to say a dotted quarter note and then make another copy of it and have it play for just an eighth note. And then I'll leave the last slice alone. So this is a really easy way to experiment with reordering the parts of a loop into something that fits your creative vision. Every time you sit down to sample something off of your turntable or from your synthesizer, wherever, you often have some kind of spark of creativity and you don't want your workflow to get in the way of that. Using the slice to MIDI method in Ableton Live, the workflow becomes almost transparent so that you can get to the important business of writing your track. So let's just recap what we've done so far before we move on to the next video. I'll come back here to the original breakbeat. As you can see, it started out as just an audio clip playing back and looping. I went ahead and right clicked on it and went to slice to new MIDI track. When I did so, it brought up this handy little dialog here. From here I chose how many slices I wanted. I told it I just wanted it to slice every half note out for me. And then I chose a slicing preset. I just went with the built in zero velocity. And again, I'll show you how to create your own in a little bit. When I hit OK on that, it created this new track, along with automatically creating this new MIDI clip. We took a look at the drum interface, and we checked out some of these pads, and how each pad represented one slice, that is one half note. We also saw that Ableton Live's slicing preset can be a little quirky at times, and it created this odd slice right here with no audio in it. All we had to do was just delete that slice to reduce our confusion, and we moved on. Next, we took a look at some of the helpful macro knob assignments that Ableton Live sets up for us, including these handy envelope features, as well as some cool looping functions that allow us to do some practical things, but they also allow us to get crazy with some glitched out looping features. We also took a look at choke groups, which ensure that none of the slices will overlap with one another, and that really helps to keep the mix clean and the audio not so muddy. When you have slices overlapping with one another, you can create all kinds of phase issues, or the melodies can clash with one another unintentionally. This way you can trigger the slices as fast or as slow as you want, and anytime you trigger a new slice, it will cut off whatever happened before. Not only that, but if you're writing hip-hop, this is a great way to recreate that classic chopped up audio sound, such that the audio of one slice isn't overlapping with the audio of another, and they're cutting one another off in a very rhythmic fashion. We also saw how each of these slices is represented by one of the simplers, with the looping settings set up correctly to represent whatever half note that slice represents. And then we also saw these little green boxes over the parameters, and we know now that when a parameter has a green box over it, it just means that it's being controlled by one of the macro knobs over here. We took a look at the map mode feature, which shows you what all the knobs are assigned to, and also paid special attention to the fact that you can set minimum and maximum settings with which the macro knobs can actually modify the individual parameters. That way when you have one macro knob turned all the way up, but you have the maximum set to say 90%, even though that knob is all the way up, the parameter that it's changing will only be up to 90%. The realization to come away with here is that they're really encouraging you to take one macro knob and assign it to multiple parameters, but to do so in a logical way. 
If there are certain parameters across multiple devices in your drum rack that seem logically related in your mind, you're now able to take a macro knob and change all of those parameters with just one knob turn. But not only that, each of those parameters can be modified in a drastically different way even though you're only turning one knob up or down. That's the beauty of being able to turn on map mode and change the minimum and maximum values that the parameters can actually go to when they're modified by the macro knobs. Last, we took a look at just how easy it is to manipulate and change around the original loop just by dragging around these MIDI notes in the newly created MIDI clip. You can shorten or lengthen the notes, rearrange them, and basically create a whole new arrangement from the original sample that you got from your turntable or wherever. Being able to do this quickly and efficiently is absolutely at the heart of having an efficient sample-based workflow in Ableton Live. If it looked at all daunting to you, my only recommendation would be to review these videos a couple more times, but most importantly, to practice with these techniques yourself. For the next video, we're going to dig a little deeper into the drum racks device, and we're going to drop some effects in and assign the various slices to different effects settings. And then we're also going to experiment with chopping this other break that we got out that's more melodic than it is rhythmic.